So our Old Testament lesson is Psalm 27, and this is actually my favorite psalm, and I thought I was going to talk about it more, but uh, the sermon was too long. So, but it's a, it's a psalm that talks about like strength and reliance on God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in the shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your ways, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. The New Testament lesson is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus, but beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel and not with eloquent wisdom so that the cross of Christ may may not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Here ends the reading. So today we're looking at a section from 1 Corinthians, and one of the things that's clear about this letter is that the Apostle Paul is writing to First Church Corinth because they were having quarrels. I thought quarrels seemed a mild sort of translation, so others have gone with contentions or rivalry or simply fighting with each other. Suffice it to say, people at First Church Corinth are not getting along. And based on later parts of the letter, we know some of the issues stemmed from the Corinthian church having people of a variety of social classes and backgrounds all mixed together. And then there was the issue that the church was still just a very new thing at this point. So Paul, who's been involved with the founding of the church, writes this letter to try and sort everything out. Now the conflicts Paul lists based on the intelligence he's gotten from Chloe's people are conflicts about identity. People in the church are dividing into factions based on who baptized them. Now that might seem weird to us, but one commentary pointed out that this is really no different than the fights churches have today over pastors. Perhaps a fight about a pastor is something some of you have experienced at some point. It's not uncommon for people to get caught up on who the pastor is and to lose focus on other things that matter. Now, in addition to getting caught up on the pastor, churches since Paul's day have had millennia to figure out other improper things to stake identities in. 
Now, I will caveat this by saying uh, conflict is not somehow unique to church. It's simply a feature of putting a bunch of people together that are all different and needing them to accomplish tasks together. Like when I was doing a clinical pastoral education as like a hospital chaplain internship, I was at Norwalk Hospital. And while I was there, they were in the process of merging with Danbury Hospital. So lots of change was happening, including like significant changes to how nursing shifts were staffed. But the change that really did everyone in was the name badges. See, Norwalk had badges that were landscaped oriented, but Danbury had portrait oriented badges. <laughs> and it was decided that the badges would be done the Danbury way. And well, Hell hath no fury like hospital staff needing to have their name badges changed. <laughs> Denbury became a swear word throughout the hospital as people muttered darkly about the merger being more of an acquisition, and some people vowed that they would never return their landscape badges. Now, however, despite other groups of uh, not church people having conflicts, Church conflicts often take on a more egregious level of petty chaos, given the fact that the church is, to use Paul's words, he says, all of you should be in agreement, and there should be no divisions among you. And despite the church being supposed to be based on an identity in Christ, we often make other things more important. So I asked uh, some colleagues for the best church fight stories about petty things, and they responded. There were many, there were many options, but I've refined it down to, I think, uh, some true gems. So uh, one colleague's church was torn apart by a conflict over new choir robes. Now, this was a very passionate topic because uh, there was fear that someone would select robes that would clash with the carpet, and I do understand that concern. But after much debate, they got down to two colors, red and blue, neither of which would clash with the carpet. But this is where the true trouble really began, because people began to see the choir robes as the church declaring political party preference. <laughs> and a red or blue choir robe became an existential issue about what the church was saying it supported and whether they were endorsing one political party. And on top of that, then people in the choir didn't want to be seen in the opposite political party's color. Another church was the product of 14 parishes being merged together. So there were duplicates of every single church thing, like communion tables, baptismal fonts, nativities. And all of them were very sacred and very special, and they all had to be used and in the sanctuary at all times. Otherwise, one church group would panic that their church's tradition and history was being forgotten and slighted. So moving furniture or really anything in the building always caused a massive fight. And that might be what my pure, purest nightmare is. Now, there was another congregation, and they fractured over a cuckoo clock. Now, before the clock came into the picture, uh, there was a faction of people who didn't like the pastor, so just bear that in mind. But the, the pastor goes on sabbatical to Germany, and he gets a fancy cuckoo clock. And it was put up in the church parish hall for everyone to enjoy. Now, the pastor was of the understanding that he was just sharing the clock for a few weeks, and then he'd take it home. However... The anti-pastor faction were of the opinion that the clock was a donation to the church and the pastor was stealing it. So they literally formed a new church when the pastor moved the clock back to his house because of the outrage of him stealing things from the church unchecked. But my favorite story stems from four Methodist churches that merged in the early 90s. At the beginning of the merger, everything went great. They all sold their buildings and bought a new space together. They figured out a new staff configuration and how to merge their leadership teams, all without issue. However, none of that was anything compared to the biggest challenge that would face the people of God of these four churches. Which peanut brittle recipe should be used for the church peanut brittle fundraiser? <laughs> now, two churches actually had the same recipe. But the other two churches, one made thin peanut brittle and the other made thick peanut brittle. The controversy got so intense that once the thin peanut brittle faction managed to get the two medium peanut brittle churches on their side, the thick peanut brittle people actually left the church. 
They all joined a nearby church and started a rival thick peanut brittle fundraiser. This peanut brittle fight became the stuff of legend in this Methodist confer conference. So the colleague who shared this story had heard tale of this great peanut, butter, peanut brittle battle of uh, 1994. But decades later, she's appointed as the associate pastor of a church that literally spent months on this giant peanut brittle fundraiser. And after looking at the months long peanut brittle prep schedule, she suddenly turns to her colleague and is like, wait, is this the peanut brittle church? And it was. This was the thin peanut brittle church. And they continuously brought up how much better their recipe was than the thick peanut brittle recipe, even over 20 years past the peanut brittle incident. Now, a few years later, this colleague was appointed to another church in the conference, and she was there some time before she realized that this was the thick peanut brittle church. But that fundraiser had since died out, and the church was like actually focused on real mission work now rather than peanut brittle. So what pretty much all of these fights have in common is, is some form of idolatry. It's some, putting something in, place of, in the place of God. It's making a peanut brittle recipe more foundational to our identity as, rather than people who belong to Christ. Now, while most of us aren't going to have a knockdown, drag out fight about a cuckoo clock because we don't have a cuckoo clock, there are other identities and things that often vie for our allegiance. In our polarized country, political party identification is one of the identities that seems to dominate at the expense of our identity in Christ. I mentioned previously uh, that the people in the church choir refuse to wear red or blue because of the horror of maybe being thought to be endorsing one political party over another. Political parties or any other identity like one based on our job or a race or ethnicity, none of those can give us what Christ gives us. None of those will bring us salvation. So to the Corinthians who are engaged in their, their fight about identity, Paul points the Corinthians to the cross. He says, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Essentially, Paul is saying our identity should be in Christ. And having our identity in Christ who died on the cross means we value things differently than society might. Now, on its face, claiming Jesus, a man who was publicly executed by the Romans as someone powerful and as God, is an absurd proposal. By standard societal values, a criminal executed by the state is the opposite of someone to look up to. It's the opposite of someone powerful. Crucif crucifixion by the state is a symbol to demonstrate to the people that the state has the power to render individuals utterly powerlessness and humiliated. A crucified savior is an oxymoron by the values of the world. It's foolish. Therefore, worshiping a crucified savior means a radical redefinition of what's important. Now, there's a lot that could be said about God's values or kingdom values versus societal or world values. And in the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount, which is all about many of these kingdom values. But the one value that Paul says is an antidote to all these conflicts playing out in First Church Corinth is love. Paul spends an entire chapter on love, and we often read it for weddings, but it's really written for such situations like the great peanut brittle battle or the cuckoo clock controversy. Paul writes, If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but I do not have love, I am a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand my body over so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. The letter 1 John talks more about love and says that we love because God first loved us and that God is love. And the greatest expression of God's love is Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And what all of this stuff means what all this stuff about love means is all of our in all our relationships 
we're meant to view people through the lens of love we're shown in Jesus. All our peanut brittle recipe, choir robe, or cuckoo clock victories are worth nothing if we don't have love. We can't control how we feel, but we can control our actions. And loving other people is all about our actions. We all have the capacity to act in a loving way. If we're not using our energy to build each other up in love, we've got nothing. Be, being united together as the body of Christ means we have obligations to one another. Loving each other as people in a covenant community means we're going to have to be patient, kind, not envious or boastful or arrogant. We're sometimes not going to get our own way. Irritability and resentment need to go. We're to celebrate the truth and not condone wrongdoing. And all of that can be a tall order. But the good news about worshiping a crucified savior is that we're shown even when the world does its worst, love, God's love can't be stopped. Christ rose from the dead and shows us the height and depth of God's love for us, for you, for me, and even for the people who put him on that cross. And even, and even though loving one another is hard and can be filled with the petty pitfalls I mentioned earlier, it's through loving one another that we share and experience God's love in the world. God is at work in us through the Holy Spirit as we strive to love our neighbors as ourselves. And if the God who died and rose from the dead is on our side as we work for love, then whom shall we fear? Amen.